Hello, my name is Tony. Okay, it would have been taking the easy option to review the peerless Howard Hawks directed Bogart and Bacall film noir masterpiece from 1946. I'd have run out of superlatives halfway through, then just declared it cosmically sublime in all aspects and called it a day. And we'd be done. Nah, so who wants easy? Well, me usually. But in this case, I thought I'd look to Michael Winner's much derided 1978 remake, and in so doing, raise more questions than I can ever hope to answer. Why would I opt to do that? Well, why would Winner opt to remake it? Two unanswered questions for a kickoff. Let's see how we get on, eh? If there was one criticism I could level at Hawke's original, it's that it doesn't make sense. It's not really an issue because it moves so damn fast and is packed so full of snappy dialogue, fascinating characters, devious interplay and timeless scenes that you don't notice. Not while you're watching it, anyway. Raymond Chandler, upon whose novel the film is based, famously stated that once he had completed it, even he didn't know did it. Which may be because there is no one singular villain or culprit to pin shit on. Six or seven people die, all killed by different people for different reasons. As with the film, the book is so intensely captivating and devilishly compelling, it doesn't matter. The only problem the viewer or reader is going to have is making it all add up in the end. But if you can cast that to one side, it's not really a problem, is it? I don't make any secret of my affection for and enjoyment of Winner as a personality and many of the films he made. I won't rehash the reasons. But on first hearing of his intention to remake The Big Sleep, I can distinctly remember thinking, why, Michael, why would you do that? More recently, I turned to his autobiography in search of answers, and although he covers the making of the film superficially and anecdotally, he doesn't reveal his motivations or what he was attempting to achieve. He stresses it was very well received in the States and cites some glowing reviews. One critic, a Walter Spencer, proclaiming it the best version of the big sleep he'd seen. Maybe the original had passed this myopic philistine by. I'm not sure about any of this and it smacks of embellishment by Winner in grandiose self-publicist mode. Why he decided to remake it, why he thought that was a good idea, remains a mystery to me. Answers on a fucking postcard, usual address. If there's one thing Winner's movie does more effectively and explicitly than the original, it's to explain what's going on, who does what to who and why. The film achieves this through blunt force showing and telling and the voiceover narration of Philip Marlowe, Robert Mitchum. Now Mitchum was 60 when he made this film, way too old to be portraying Chandler's mid-30s aged Los Angeles private investigator. Bogart was 44 when he took on the role much closer to the ballpark. It was Mitchum's second shot of the character. Three years earlier, he appeared in Dick Richards' Farewell My Lovely, a delightfully atmospheric film noir, a period piece set in 1941 Los Angeles, the geographical setting where the Philip Marlowe character traditionally operated, everything in its rightful place quite rightly. For me, Mitchum is the second best iteration of Philip Marlowe on screen. Bogart nabs the number one spot. I don't much care about Mitchum's actual age, more importantly, the way he interprets and projects the character. You want world-weary and laconic with a side order of cynicism? Mitchum's the guy. He epitomizes a tarnished nobility, crumpled humanity, the ethos of the underdog fighting for the underdog who can't fight for themselves. His determination is tenacity of spirit, the way he sails close to the wind, yet does not yield to corruption, never compromising his inherent decency and determination to do right by the living, the dying, and the dead. Forget age. Mitchum is the near-perfect embodiment of the literary character. Bogart is the consummate screen article, and you can't beat that, but still, Mitchum is a defiantly close runner-up. Using lines of dialogue and scenes taken directly from the novel, Winner's film follows the narrative trajectory thus. Private detective Philip Marlowe is summoned to the sprawling country residence of General Sternwood, James Stewart. Sternwood is obscenely rich but confined to a wheelchair and dying. He has two troublesome daughters, Charlotte, Sarah Miles, and Camilla, Candy Clark, both magnets for scandal and blackmail. The general wants Marlowe to investigate and curtail a blackmail attempt involving his youngest daughter, Camilla. During their conversation, he happens to mention that the husband of his eldest daughter, Charlotte, one Rusty Regan, has gone missing. It's presumed he became besotted and then eloped with Mona, Diana Quick, nightclub singer and wife of casino owner, property developer and all-round gangster type Eddie Mars, Oliver Reed. The general has a great deal of affection for Regan and misses his company, but doesn't outright request Marlowe investigate his disappearance. Oh, Regan was a gun runner for the IRA, topically enough for the time, worth a mention, although it's not particularly relevant. During his visit, Marlowe encounters both daughters. Camilla is childlike, mentally disturbed and sexually 
sexually promiscuous. Charlotte is more mature, less mentally disturbed by a couple of whiskers, and sexually promiscuous. Both are spoiled, damaged individuals. Charlotte seems particularly interested in whether her father has hired Marlow to find her missing husband, which he hasn't. The Sternwood chauffeur, Owen Taylor, Martin Potter, scrutinises Marlow with a look of intense well, scrutiny. Marlow focuses his inquiries on a bookshop owned by Arthur Geiger, John Justin. The shop is run by Agnes Lazelle, Joan Collins. Geiger is a gay man who, along with his young lover Carl Simon Fisher Turner, uses the bookshop as the legitimising front for producing and distributing illegal pornographic media. Seems that in return for providing heroin to Camilla, he takes compromising naked photographs of her when she is under the influence. Marlow stakes out Geiger's suburban residence and observes Camilla arriving there. As he approaches the front door, he hears gunshots and screaming from within. Inside, he finds a photo studio where Camilla is posed, drugged and naked, and Geiger is shot dead on the floor. He gets Camilla out of there and takes her home. Returning to the murder scene, Marlow is waylaid by Eddie Mars and his men, who tells him that he owns the house that Geiger was renting. Mars makes vague threats, but gives nothing away regarding his involvement. Meanwhile, the Sternwood chauffeur, Owen, drives the family car off a pier and into the river. Dead in the water. Inspector Carson, John Mills, who recommended Marlow to Sternwood, invites him to the winching of the vehicle out of the drink. He identifies Owen as the driver. Marlow follows Agnes to the home of Joe Brody, Edward Fox. Brody is her lover and something of a bounder, scoundrel, chancer and cad in old English parlance. They are the joint culprits in blackmailing Sternwood with the racy snaps of Camilla, which Agnes knew about through her association with Geiger. Marlow confronts the couple in Brody's apartment. Brody admits he was watching in the rear of the Geiger residence the night the man was killed. He saw the Sternwood chauffeur flee in the scene and gave chase. When Owen crashed into a phone booth, Brody simply stopped and took the new Camilla photos and negatives from the day's dangerous driver. Judging by his less than stellar skills behind the wheel, I found him an odd choice for a chauffeur. His death was likely suicide, it is concluded. Seems Owen was in love with Camilla and killed Geiger to protect her and get hold of the amateur porn. He legged it when Marlow turned up. Camilla bursts in with a small automatic pistol and threatens Brody with instant ventilation unless he gives her the photos. Marlow takes the gun away and persuades her to leave it to him and she reluctantly departs. Shortly after, the doorbell rings and Brody goes to answer it, thinking it's Camilla paying a return visit. He is shot multiple times through the door and dies. The perp is Geiger's boyfriend, Carl, mistakenly believing Brody whacked his sugar daddy. Marlow chases him down and hands him over to the police. Inspector Carson's superior, Commander Barker, Richard Todd, is less than delighted by Marlow's involvement in this situation. Marlow considers the blackmail case to be concluded. Only General Sternwood now suggests he would like him to find out what happened to Rusty Regan and confirm his whereabouts. Marlow notices he's being followed by a man in a car. At first, he thinks it's someone working for Eddie Mars, but when he visits Mars Casino, the gangster denies any knowledge. He expresses gratitude that Marlow omitted to mention his name to the police and offers him money, which Marlow politely refuses. He finds Charlotte there at the roulette table, gambling compulsively. When she leaves, Marlow saves her from being mugged for her winnings and escorts her home. They share a brief intimate moment, but Marlow turns down her offer of something more, much to Charlotte's affrontery and anger. Returning home, Marlow finds Camilla naked in his bed. Much to her affrontery and anger, he throws her out. Turning down a shitload of cash and two sexual propositions in one night. That's some strength of character. And the very point at which I realised I'm nothing like Philip Marlow. Marlow's tale reveals himself as Harry Jones, Colin Blakely. He's working with Agnes, who is willing to sell Marlow information on the whereabouts of Eddie Marr's wife, Rona. Turning up at Jones' office, Marlow hears voices and conceals himself. He witnesses Jones being poisoned to death by Lash Canino, Richard Boone, a hoodlum and killer in the employ of Eddie Mars. Marlow pays Agnes and, based on her intel, tracks Canino to an isolated country garage. Captured and beaten unconscious by Canino, Marlow comes round in a country house. He's tied to a chair in the presence of Rona Mars. Persuading her to help him escape, he retrieves a gun from his car and draws Canino out. Canino emerges, holding Rona as a shield. He's got an Uzi submachine gun. Marlow has rigged Canino's car to explode, and when it does, it acts as a distraction and Rona breaks free. In the ensuing firefight, Marlow blasts the living shit out of Canino, shooting him dead. Seems Rona never actually absconded with Rusty Regan after all. It was a smokescreen subterfuge to help Eddie Mars cover something up. Suspecting the truth, Marlow returns to the Sternwood residence and encounters Camilla in the grounds. He returns her pistol 
and she asks him to teach her how to shoot. At a nearby Roman ruin, Marlow sets up a tin can as a target. Thing is, Camilla already knows how to shoot. She empties the pistol at Marlow, only he's filled it with blanks. Camilla flips her knickers, has a seizure and foams at the mouth. Overreact much, love? Camilla had murdered Rusty Regan, shooting him at the ruin when he rejected her advances. As Marlow had also rejected her charming overtures, her impulsive or maybe calculated reaction to him was the same. Charlotte had persuaded Eddie Mars to help her cover up the crime to protect her sister and was now in his debt. Marlow decides to protect General Stonewood from the truth and not to go to the police, on the proviso that Charlotte has Camilla packed off to the booby hatch. Sorry, I mean hospitalised in a therapeutic mental health facility where she can get the care and help she needs, and hopefully not shoot anyone else. Marlowe's closing voiceover waxes lyrical on the nature of wealth, power, life and death, the big sleep, and the film ends. I have issues. Yes, I know, you might well have noticed. Other to that, I have issues with this film. Winner directs it competently enough from his own screenplay. Where and when he can use scenes and dialogue taken directly from Chandler's novel, he does just that. If you can relegate the original Hawks flick to the outer reaches of your memory, then it's a decent enough and relatively solid mystery detective flick on a standalone basis. There's no denying Winner's capacity to engage the services of an all-star cast here. Mitchum is still great as Marlowe, even if he does seem a bit sleepier and and shoulder shrugging than usual. Unavoidably, he is playing the character as an older and more jaded personality with an increasingly resigned, slightly fatalistic air. He was more dynamic in Farewell My Lovely, which was a far better film. By the time he made this, he was struggling with an alcohol problem. Then you've got Oliver Reed, whose relationship with the booze eventually defined his later life and career. Although Winner insists neither man drank on set, he admitted that some days Reed seemed out of it due to the festivities of the night before. Chuck in the magnificent Richard Boone, who, Winner observed, habitually drank hard liquor all day long, on and off set, yet never appeared drunk. It was less Alcoholics Anonymous and more Alcoholics Unanimous, yet all three acquit themselves well enough. I can settle for an underpowered Mitchum as Marlowe, Reed being suitably dark and brooding, and Boone radiating a frightfully thuggish and menacing energy. Sarah Miles channels her inner sexual eccentricity to make her Charlotte appealing in a dotty, upper-crust crumpet kind of way. Whereas Candy Clark, an actress capable of impressive layered dramatic work, as evidenced by the man who felt worth, acts like an amphetamine junkie who's just discovered and assimilated the arch spirit of British pantomime theatrics into their wild chemical trip. Nutty, overheated, wooden and wholly unconvincing as a jacked up woman child. Foaming at the mouth was the most fitting full stop to her performance. The supporting players including John Collins, Edward Fox, John Mills, Richard Todd, Harry Andrews, Colin Blake, Lee, Dudley Sutton and Diana Quick reads like a ring around of performers on winner's contact list he just phoned up and roped in on the off chance they'd care to take part if they weren't doing anything else pressing at the time. It definitely establishes some attractive curb appeal. And not to forget Jimmy Stewart, another welcome additive of legendary acting class and gravitas. The problem with The Big Sleep 1978 is it's not Chandler, it's not Philip Marlowe and it's not film noir. The cribs from the novel A Cut and Paste Job lacking in nuance and emotional context. Mainly, the geography just doesn't work for it. If, like Farewell My Lovely, itself a remake, it had that period setting, that late 30s, early 40s Los Angeles environment to play in, it would have been all the better for it. No, it still wouldn't have crawled forward to kiss the bootlaces of the original, but it would have been a whole lot closer to doing so. Location-wise, Winner steers clear of tourist London, zoning in on places not ordinarily seen on screen, but it's still looks quaint, cosy, homely and threatening. Marlowe needs to walk in dark streets under shorting neon signs, across rain-slicked avenues, into mean-looking alleyways, past speakeasies, gin joints, dive bars, strip clubs, roach-infested motels, hot jazz and LA sleaze and corruption permeating all. He doesn't fit in the framework of the bucolic English countryside, genteel villages, 60s housing boom suburbia, net curtains, Victorian and Edwardian terraces. It's not his beat. It feels all wrong. It's Agatha Christie country. Much less Philip Marlowe, more Philippa Marple. 
Albert Finney's gumshoe took the Chandler model and dropped it into early 70s Liverpool. It had the sense and creative nous to make it a compelling satire, the main character's private dick aspirations stemming from a combination of wish fulfilment fantasy and possibly undiagnosed mental illness. The struggle of a lifelong loser to succeed at something. Winners, the big sleep is gumshoe taking itself seriously and dispensing with the humour. Heading down that road, gumshoe would have failed on all counts. The big Sleep 1978 fails on most. The bulk of winners' movies, for all their technical and creative faults, have some level of dynamism and propulsive energy keeping them afloat, something to tether your attention. The Big Sleep is never very energetic, except in brief flashes. The bloody shooting of Brody, the car roaring off the pier, the gunfight with Canino, uh, that's about it. It looks quite mundane and feels drab and listless, even the score by Jerry Fielding, usually a reliable proposition, is very by the numbers. Like something he dashed off in a weekend whilst wondering if Clint Eastwood was going to call any time soon. It's an oddity, a curio, a gamble, an off-key curveball that doesn't work out and result in winning the game. Like I say, I have no idea why Winner made it or why he wanted to make it. I have even less idea why I don't hate it outright, why I return to it every so often or why I chose this moment in time to spark up the Blu-ray and watch it again. Candy Clark's nude scenes don't impress or exert that much influence over me. I suppose, in the end, any film that has Robert Mitchell Richard Boone, Oliver Reed, Edward Fox, Jimmy Stewart, and such a stellar supporting cast in it is never going to be without at least something to recommend it. And I suspect it still manages to appeal to the sad, pathetic nostalgia junkie in me. Thank you. I'm grateful as always for your time and attention. Do whatever you want to do next. Hit like, don't like, comment, subscribe. Be a patron of my Patreon thing. Make a financial contribution via the thanks button. Whatever you choose is fine by me. I will no doubt be back in the fullness of time. Until then, you take good care, pilgrims. Careful how you go on those mean streets.